The self-defense claim is used in a lot of cases when victims are faced with imminent danger. Seeing how tricky self-defense cases can be based on the presentation of evidence and proving the actions of everyone involved, the verdict can be hard to deliver. When Victoria Rickman called the police in a panic and confessed that she'd attacked her ex-fiance in self-defense, it seemed simple enough. But as the investigation unfolded, unimaginable things surfaced, and when a true crime reality TV show got into the mix of this mess, the case turned into one of the most sensational coverages ever. Was Victoria truly scared for her life on that unlucky Friday the 13th of September 2013? Or was there something more sinister lurking in the trenches? William Carter Jr., better known simply as Will, was born on October 7, 1982, in Phoenix, Arizona, to parents William James Carter Sr. and Caro Carter. Not too long after his birth, the family moved from Phoenix to Orlando and stayed there until 1988, after which the family made the move to Atlanta, Georgia and called it their home. It's also here where the rest of the case takes place. Will was defined as a friendly, calm, gentle, and athletic person through and through. He played football and baseball in high school, a ton of golf with his father, and developed a deep passion for surfing while in Orlando. After graduating from high school, Will enrolled in the College of Charleston, and after he graduated from college, he worked multiple jobs over the next 10 years to figure out what he really wanted to do. Eventually, Will founded Georgia Select Insurance Company in Marietta, and he served as the CEO of the auto insurance company that he created from the ground up in four years. He was a successful businessman as a startup grew to five offices and 30 employees during this time. But Will wasn't the type of CEO to boss everyone around. He was a hardworking and friendly person who worked with his employees almost 12 hours a day. Will had a contagious smile and was great at entertaining a room. While all of this was happening, Will had also been married and had a daughter, Lily, who he adored with every inch of his life. The marriage, though, soon fizzled out and the couple got divorced, but remained on good terms for the sake of their daughter. Will's life wasn't smooth by any means. He struggled with substance abuse, which unfortunately caused a couple of run-ins with the police. But after 10 years, he decided to turn his life around, went into rehab, and came out completely sober. While running his business and spending time with his daughter and the family, Will hardly had time for himself. But soon he met Victoria Rickman, better known as Tori a woman who came in and changed his life forever. Not a lot is known about Tori's childhood, but what we do know is that she jumped into marriage with a man quite early on in her life, and things were anything but perfect. There were numerous allegations of abuse from both sides, and unsurprisingly, the marriage ended in divorce. The only good thing that came out of this marriage was Victoria's son, who was her pride and joy. Victoria's father, Paul, and close friends defined her as a great woman and an attentive mother. In 2010, Will and Victoria met through mutual friends, and a romance budded after bonding on being single parents, as well as their other interests. To call their relationship a whirlwind is an understatement, because shortly after, the couple got engaged and they moved in together. Their respective children, who were of the same age group, also went along with each other, so things seemed to be perfect. Until they weren't. The relationship between Will and Victoria, as quickly as it escalated, soon came tumbling down, and fights were breaking out right, left, and center. During the three-year tumultuous relationship, Victoria made multiple physical abuse allegations against Will. She documented the injuries and showed them to her friends, who were understandably concerned for her safety. But that's not all. Throughout the relationship, Will and Victoria collected a huge list of police reports against each other, ranging from domestic violence to battery. Will and Victoria's relationship took a very toxic turn, and after some time, they decided to end the engagement. But with the relationship being as bad as it was, both Will and Victoria seemed to reconcile, break up, and repeat. But things came to a serious and fatal head on the fateful day of the 13th of September, 2013. To imagine that this event took place on Friday the 13th makes this case one of the more eerie criminal occurrences. But on September 13th, 2013, 30-year-old Victoria was staying over at a friend's house on Clifton Road in DeKalb County, Georgia, 
when at 2.30 a.m. she called the Atlanta PD reporting that she had shot her ex-fiance. I tried to rape me again and I tried to ask him to stop and I, I shot him. I shot him? Yeah, I shot him. And then I got the murder. Will, in an act of self-defense, as he allegedly tried to force himself on her. Victoria claimed that she didn't mean to take his life, she just wanted to stop his forceful advances. The responding officers arrived at the scene, led by Detective Summer Benton. Benton initially believed Victoria's statement, thinking that she'd actually acted on pure fight or flight instinct. But when her team arrived on the scene, she got more than one surprise of the night. And it's safe to say that things got messy from this point on. Because it turns out Benton's team was being trailed by the crew of Inside Homicide, a true crime television series. And they started to film the investigation from start to finish without so much as asking the team or the people involved for permission. But this aside, when Benton arrived at Victoria's house with a TV crew close behind, suspicions were already starting to rise against Victoria and her seemingly frenzied statement of self-defense. For starters, Victoria was standing outside the house wearing her pajamas with her hair washed, holding her dog. Even more alarming was the fact that there weren't any injuries on Victoria's body. Furthermore, the house didn't seem in disarray or show any signs of forced entry, as Victoria stated in the call. To put it simply, this just looked like an ordinary night for the couple. Literally nothing suggested anything untoward had previously taken place, other than the crime scene in the bedroom. Upon entering the bedroom, officers discovered a disrobed Will on the bed who had passed away from nine rounds being fired at him. He was only 30 years old. On the nightstand of Will's side of the bed, his gold watch was sitting undisturbed and a gold chain that he always wore was clutched in his left hand. Will's clothes were discarded on the floor, but other than that, the room didn't look like there'd been a fight or a struggle, if you don't count the toppled over lamp and noise machine on the nightstand of Victoria's bedside. Shortly after, Will's body was taken for an autopsy after breaking the news of the passing to his parents, who were struck with immense grief. Meanwhile, Victoria had been taken to Grady Hospital for a medical examination for assault. Surprisingly, although there were signs that Victoria and Will had been intimate with each other, there weren't any injuries or trauma that could say for certain that she was forced to engage in activities against her will. When Detective Benton got the news, her suspicions got even more concrete. And now Victoria went from a defenseless woman to the prime suspect in Benton's eyes. As the crime scene was being combed, Officers also recovered the firearm that Victoria used inside the nightstand drawer farthest from Will. It was a 40 caliber semi-automatic firearm with four rounds inside. There were also nine bullet casings scattered throughout the room. Remember this detail because we'll get back to that in a moment. The detectives created a simulation of what might have happened on the night of Will's passing, and it was believed that Will had his back to Victoria when she fired at him, causing him to fall onto the bed where the rest of the rounds were fired and led to Will's tragic demise. Now, let's get back to Victoria. After the hospital examination, she was taken straight to the police station, where Detective Benton questioned her. Victoria started by maintaining her innocence, saying that she merely acted in self-defense and that she did nothing wrong. She also went on to say that Will had allegedly been forceful with her in the past, but he never got in trouble with the law. But before the interrogation could go any further, Victoria refused to answer any more questions without a lawyer. She also underwent an examination for her injuries, and her body was photographed for evidence. Something that was particularly bizarre during the interrogation is that a small scuffle broke out in the interrogation room between Victoria and Detective Benton, as the detective was trying to take Victoria's phone as evidence. This whole situation was just weird. Finally, almost seven hours after Will's passing, as the interrogation came to an end, Victoria received the news. She wasn't walking out of that interrogation room as a free woman. Rather, she was being charged and arrested for taking the life of her ex-fiance. Victoria's reaction to the news was especially chilling. She lacked emotion, was indifferent, and wasn't even trying to plead her innocence or make a scene. But it wasn't enough to take the case to trial, though. Detectives knew if they wanted to get to the bottom of this case, they were going to have to go elbow deep. And all this digging is about to open up a whole other can of worms. To piece the story together, Detective Benton reached out to Will's parents, who were understandably still mourning after learning about their son's sudden passing. 
But the revelations that came forward were mind-boggling, to say the least. Right off the bat, Will's parents, Will Sr. and Caro, were furious at Victoria for slandering Will and suggesting he'd even been remotely violent towards her. They urged that the whole self-defense stance was devised by Victoria and revealed that she was the abusive one in the relationship. This claim was backed up by an incident that occurred in January of 2012, more than a year before Will's passing. Will was visiting his parents when they noticed a huge bleeding injury behind his ear and what looked like teeth marks on his shoulder. Will claimed that Victoria had attacked him, and then she proceeded to bite him on the shoulder after a very heated argument. I mean, who even does that? On another occasion, Will Sr. explained how Victoria had struck Will in the head with a heavy object, again claiming self-defense, and showed marks on her wrists as proof of the violence to the police. Surprisingly, Will got arrested on battery, although the charge was dropped by Victoria shortly after and she confessed that she made up the claims. Despite all of this and his parents' warnings, Will tried to reconcile with Victoria, but there was more. Two weeks later, Will's parents got to know just how rageful Victoria was when she didn't get what she wanted. Understandably, Will's parents didn't want Victoria in their home because they felt like their son was in danger. Victoria, in a fit of rage, straight up told them that she was well-armed and didn't have to do what they told her to do. And if you thought this was a dramatic escalation, then this next bit will stun you to no end because Victoria seemed to be on a roll. In May of 2013, just four months prior to the devastating passing of Will, Victoria broke into Will's home in Cobb County and pulled him around the house by his gold chain necklace, demanding to know if he'd been talking to someone behind her back. When Will tried to make her leave, Victoria proceeded to run around the neighborhood, screaming that Will had forced himself on her. When the police arrived at the scene, Victoria turned the tables on Will, alleging that he'd violated her, even though he'd apparently done nothing wrong. That didn't work out in Victoria's favor, though, because she was the one who ended up getting charged with battery. And get this, these charges were still looming over her head when Will lost his life, so Victoria was most likely not going to be let off easy. It was pretty clear from these events that Victoria was the aggressor in the relationship, and even Will's parents believed that she was malicious. Heartbreakingly enough, Will couldn't see for himself, and he truly wanted to mend the relationship. On the other side, Victoria's friends had completely different opinions of Will, and according to them, he was the one who allegedly subjected Victoria to violence. Brittany Morgan, Victoria's best friend, had a lot to say about the relationship between Will and Victoria and it wasn't nice. Brittany painted Victoria as a woman who had constantly had her boundaries violated in the past, and with Will, it wasn't any different. Brittany claimed that Will was manipulative, violent, and very harsh with Victoria, and she even saw the injuries on Victoria's body. In fact, Brittany encouraged her to document the injuries for evidence. To add to that, Brittany was convinced that on the night of September 13th, Victoria was backed into a corner and that she didn't have any option left but to attack Will viciously. To add fuel to the fire, Will's past drug charges were also dragged into this mess, even though they were totally unrelated. Will's parents had been nothing but forthcoming about their son's struggles, and when he made a turn in his life for the better, they couldn't have been more proud of him. But Victoria and her friends seemed to believe otherwise, and strongly held on to the fact that Will was a terrible person and that Victoria was trying her hardest to leave the relationship. In May of 2013, Victoria filed for a restraining order against Will in Cobb County Court. There, she met with Sheriff's Deputy Frederick Price, who was on duty while the rest of the office was closed. He took one look at Victoria, saw her injuries, and wrote up a restraining order on the spot. Not only this, Price was extra concerned for her safety and gave Victoria his personal 40 caliber semi-automatic firearm for protection and even took her to a shooting range for practice. Coincidentally, this was the same firearm used on Will the night of the attack. By this point, things started getting messy beyond measure. And after all of these details surfaced, the pivotal question reared its head. Who was guilty and who was innocent? Will or Victoria? While being held in jail awaiting her trial, Victoria requested bail, which was obviously denied. To add to the mess and divide opinions and the community even more, Inside Homicide came out with their episode on the real-life saga of Will and Victoria. Their main focal point was Detective Benton's investigation, 
and a narrative was drawn that Victoria, a divorced temptress, was guilty of Will's murder, even before the case went to court for trial. Now, this was wrong on so many levels. For starters, imagine the hurt and emotional trauma Will's family and friends relived. It was insensitive to turn a real-life crime into a source of entertainment, especially when Will's parents were crestfallen at the loss of their son. It's one thing to cover a case after a verdict has already been announced, but to go behind the backs of the families, the investigators, and everyone is just downright dangerous, considering the investigation was still actively underway at that time. The families wanted the case to be handled by the law, based on evidence, not see it get glorified and blown out of proportion on TV screens. Since the TV and entertainment industry was sadly jumping on the reality show bandwagon, with no consideration for Will or his family, reporter Aaron Moriarty from 48 Hours reached out to Will's family, Victoria, and everyone involved for an interview before the trial, though Victoria basked in the limelight of the attention and stood by her innocence. See, Victoria claimed that on the fateful night of September 13th, Will had apparently relapsed and was acting strangely. But this claim couldn't be corroborated because on the night of the crime, Detective Benton didn't request Will's toxicology and blood alcohol report. So no one knew what Will had in his system when he passed away. Benton, quick to her defense, said that since it was her first case in DeKalb County, she simply didn't know that she had to request those things specifically. Even though Will's blood was taken in as evidence, it was later destroyed since there was apparently no need for a toxicology report, or so they thought at the time. Fast forward to August 22nd, 2017, nearly four years after the tragic passing of Will, and the case finally went to trial. It lasted two weeks, and Victoria's defense attorney, Amanda Palmer, was head to head with Sheila Ross, one of Georgia's most renowned prosecutors. As expected, the trial was anything but smooth, with both sides trying to convince the jury with their respective evidence. The prosecution alleged that Victoria had premeditated the entire thing, and Will's demise was anything but an instinctual fight-or-flight response. The defense, on the contrary, presented Victoria as a woman suffering from PTSD, and that a stronger, taller, and abusive man was violating her. Victoria's friends also testified in court, obviously in her favor. The defense also called Will's psychiatrist, Dr. John Lockridge, onto the stand, who divulged a peculiar detail about Will. He testified that Will called three days before his demise, stating that he was having delusions of being famous on TV. See, Will was on antidepressants to help with sleep issues, a fact that Dr. Lockridge confirmed. But since Detective Benton never requested a toxicology report, we can never know what medications were in Will's system, if there were any and whether they could have influenced his mental state at the time of his passing or not. On the second day of the trial, Detective Benton took the stand and gave her version of events, and yet another pivotal revelation was made. Remember the rounds that were fired at the crime scene? Well, Summer Benton, a seasoned detective with over 16 years of experience under her belt, made a big time mistake. She believed that the 40 caliber weapon used in the attack against Will had been reloaded since there were nine casings on the floor of the crime scene and four in the magazine. Benton thought that the weapon only held 12 rounds. Her theory all along was that if Victoria had reloaded the weapon, the self-defense claim wasn't valid anymore, since she clearly had every intention of ending Will's life that night, a detail which was aired on TV. But the weapon's capacity was actually 13 rounds, so this small slip-up brought back the notion that Victoria's case could be that of self-defense because she didn't reload the weapon. Surprisingly, Benton stood by her claim that she didn't make a mistake and that her tiny moment of misinformation wasn't a big deal in the grand scheme of things. Regardless of this tiny sliver of hope for Victoria, the prosecution had more evidence up their sleeves to undermine Victoria's helpless facade. The prosecutor firmly believed that Victoria was a manipulative seductress who charmed men with her allure and made them fulfill her desires. To solidify this stance, Jeremy Fordham, a former acquaintance of Victoria's, was brought to court. According to Fordham, Victoria sent him explicit pictures of herself. He wasn't the only one Victoria had charmed with her sensuality, because Robbie Ray, a lieutenant from the county police department, had also exchanged suggestive texts with Victoria. What's shocking is that Frederick Price, the same deputy who'd given her his gun, was also called to the stand, and he confessed that he was interested in Victoria from the get-go, although their relationship never got intimate. 
If that wasn't staggering enough, it was revealed that Victoria contacted Price the night of September 13th after attacking Will, and he instructed her to call 911. Seeing his uncooperativeness in helping to solve the case, he was fired from his job five days after the fatal attack on Will. Another witness, William Plunkett, Victoria's former roommate, testified that upon eviction, she threatened to call the police and tell them that he had violated her. This woman just loved to pull the defenseless female card. It's just sickening. The reason why so many people are afraid to speak out when something like this really does happen is because people like Victoria have given these allegations a bad rap because they just make things up in order to spite the men in their lives. It's just gross and so many women are forced into silence because people don't believe them, all because of women like Victoria. But all this aside, prosecution had one last card up their sleeve. And honestly, they saved the most impactful bit for last. And that was Victoria's phone. Detective Kevin Leonpatcher, who was responsible for the forensic investigation of Victoria's phone, came across a paper trail of evidence. 66,000 texts, to be exact. And this discovery helped detectives to create a timeline of what happened on that dreadful night when Will passed away. It was revealed that Victoria had asked her friend, Andrew Scar, that she needed his house, where she was staying temporarily for herself that night. Scar, not being suspicious, stayed at his mother's and left Victoria alone in his home. Shortly after, Victoria called Will, and although it's unknown what they were talking about, Will showed up at Victoria's house after midnight. Detectives speculated that Victoria had called Will to meet at her house. The recovered data list also included texts from Will being furious with Victoria for contacting his ex-wife, with Will calling Victoria the, quote, love of his life. There were even conversations between Frederick Price, the former police officer, and a panicked Victoria because she believed that the battery charges pressed by Will in May of 2013 were going to affect her son's custody case. In Victoria's phone gallery, detectives hit another jackpot. There were many pictures of her injuries, which seemed fine at first considering she was a supposed victim of violence. But what wasn't normal was the time when these were taken. It was exactly a day before the fatal attack on Will. The detectives concluded that this was her plan all along to get away with the attack. Now, I don't know about you, but if this isn't premeditation, I don't know what is. And combine that with the fact that Will wasn't dropping the charges against Victoria for battery, well, there's a clear motive here. But there was one more eerie discovery that detectives made, and it threw Victoria's battered woman stance clear out the window. After alleging that Will had violated her in May of 2013, Victoria tried to barge into Will's house later that night while recording the incidents on her phone. Will, visibly surprised and scared, asked Victoria to leave and called her a toxic web of lies. Victoria, refusing to leave, egged him on to call the police on her. This video entailed that Victoria's behavior wasn't that of a scared woman suffering from aftershocks of PTSD and domestic violence, because in all honesty, who in their right mind would want to meet the person who allegedly violated them just days earlier? As the trial came to an end on September 1st, 2017, the jury came forth with the verdict, and Victoria was found guilty. And this verdict was a much needed closure for Will's family, and his parents thought that their son was finally at peace since justice was served. On October 5th, 2017, Victoria's sentencing was held, and throughout the trial, Victoria showed no remorse for ending Will's life opted not to take the stand at the trial, and only got emotional when the defense presented her side of the story. Before the sentencing, Victoria pleaded with the judge for leniency, as she claimed to be a battered woman, a victim of PTSD and violence, and the mother of a child. Funny how she didn't feel the same way when she ended the life of a man who was also a loving and devoted father, and that she didn't think it was necessary to apologize to Will's family for their permanent loss. Victoria was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus five years for the weapons charge. Her appeals and motions since then have been denied, and she remains incarcerated at the Pulaski State Prison in Hopkinsville, Georgia. As for Will's parents, they're doing their best to move on while still reeling from the painful loss of their son. In memory of Will and paying homage to how amazing of a person he was, his friends and employees made a Facebook page called Remember Will Carter. It's a memory tag of sorts and a way to connect with Will because even though he's gone, many people will carry his memories forever. 
Will's daughter, Lily, remembers and misses her father every single day, lamenting that he'll never be there for when she accomplishes the many milestones in her life, but she says he's always in her heart. Will's mom, Caro, understands Lily's emotions fully and is saddened by the fact that Will won't be there when her daughter graduates or gets married. For Will's parents, Loki, his beloved senior dog, at the ripe age of 13, is another connection to their son. Will's had Loki since he was a puppy, and he gives Will's family some level of comfort and a sense of closeness to Will and the drive to move on with their lives. This case was all sorts of crazy, and it just goes to show that things really aren't what they seem on the surface a lot of the time. If you're someone who's in a dangerous relationship, no matter if you're a man or a woman and trying to make things work, it's always best to reach out to others and let them know what you're dealing with. It's often the case that maybe you just can't see the forest for the trees. I'm a big believer that nearly every relationship can be saved, almost every single time. But in cases like this, it would have been far better if Will had just distanced himself from the situation as his parents had wished. I don't say that to cast even one single ounce of the blame on him. I merely say that because sometimes we just need to listen to the people around us when we know that they have our best interest in mind. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you like this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.